Hey, what's up? Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Roll Pod, an Alabama sports podcast from Bama 247. I am staff writer Cody Goodwin, and joining me today, fellow staff writer Mike Rodak. Mike, we've got a little while before Alabama's Rose Bowl national semifinal game against Michigan on New Year's Day, so I wanted to take today to discuss a few other things. Alabama men's hoops uh, off and running. All-American lists are coming out for college football season. Um, most all of college football's award winners have been named over the last week and weekend. So plenty still to discuss on today's show. But before we get into all of that, um, we're recording this on Tuesday, December 12th. We have 13 days until Christmas. Mike, what's the best Christmas movie? Uh, (coughs) (coughs) choking now thinking about it. Um, I know I watched home alone a lot as a kid. I haven't seen it in a while. I liked Home Alone. I mean, I feel like my son loves Elf. Uh, He's probably watched that three times. He's watched Rudolph about six times. Um, I don't know. I don't have like a favorite one personally, but I remember watching the Home Alone movies a lot as a kid. Home Alone's a good one. I personally like Elf because it's like it's one of those movies that even if you're a Grinch, um, you like you have to smile and laugh at that one. Right. Like Buddy the Elf, what's your favorite color? Like it's, I don't know. I feel like it's, it's a classic and I don't know that it meant to be a classic, but it just kind of became one by accident. Maybe it was very well done. I mean, Will Ferrell's obviously really good. Um, so that's a good starting spot, but I don't know. I mean, there's different, like there's different avenues to go. You know, you can go modern, you can go the classic, um, you know, stop motion type of movies. You can, I mean, Die Hard, I guess there's the classic debate. <laughs> that was, I was going to ask you that if Die Hard's a Christmas movie. I've though. never, I honestly have never seen it. So I couldn't tell you if it's a Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter movie. I have no idea. I've never seen it. I'm, I'm not really a movie guy, if you haven't picked up on that. I, I'm not either. Like, if I see a movie, I will rewatch the movie over and over and over again. Like, I've told myself that I'm at some point going to go see Oppenheimer because, like, I, I, I enjoy history and I enjoy biopics when they're very well done. And I still haven't seen it because... I'm just bad at that. Um, I, I <laughs> the Die Hard as a Christmas movie argument is just funny to like, you know, poke at people because like it's not a Christmas movie, but it takes place like during Christmas, you know, like in the, like that's the I feel like a lot of movies do, though. I mean, yeah, I that's like the end all be all of what a Christmas movie is. I mean, right. And so like I tell people, you know, again, just to, you know, poke the bear, like if Die Hard's a Christmas movie, so is Harry Potter. Right. Because it also takes place, you know, like most of those movies take place during Christmas. So, you know, and then people push back on that and then, you know, naturally in fighting and away we go. But I don't know. I was curious. I, I, I don't you know, I'm going to I'm going to ask Talty, um, you know, because I'm hopefully going to have him on later this week. I'm going to ask him his uh, spoiler alert, his favorite Christmas song. So I feel like that's also Ooh. equally as hotly debated as perhaps favorite or best Christmas movie. So, you know, tis the season and all that um serious 71 that's what i've been doing (laughs) i don't listen to christmas movie my so christmas movie christmas music my big my big rule because i'm a big thanksgiving guy because like as a wrestler i just didn't get to fully enjoy thanksgiving as much as others growing up my big rule is no christmas music until we get through thanksgiving like black friday blare it out like blow your speakers out you know turn on the christmas music but like until then like thanksgiving needs some proper do because it is such an underrated and also arguably the best holiday. But it's always a busy week, like you said, for wrestling, but also for football now, um, Iron Bowl week and, um, you know, basketball tournaments and all sorts of stuff. And I don't know, even if they change the schedule and there's talk about the new CFP format, everything getting moved up a week and the Iron Bowl being the Saturday before Thanksgiving, all that's going to mean is that, Thanksgiving week is SEC championship week. So we can't escape either way. I don't know. <laughs> Thanksgiving week is ever going to be easy for our line of work. Oh, no. Well, and before I came down here, Thanksgiving was used to be like the buffer week that I would take between like covering high school football and covering wrestling. Because like in Iowa, the high school football state championships were always the week, always the week before Thanksgiving. So like I would go sit at the Unidome at UNI for a few days and cover football And then I would get like, you know, four or five days to just like catch my breath. And then there was usually like wrestling duels, like the Saturday, Sunday after Thanksgiving. So then I would just like, you know, go do that. And then away we went with wrestling season. But um, so, yeah, that was that was something like I'm glad we kind of have a little bit of a buffer before the Rose Bowl, because like, you know, 
some I, I feel like all of us in some way shape or form need to recharge a little bit before we get down to la so I'll get used to it I mean, <laughs> next year's schedule it's yeah well 12 team playoff and if alabama does not get a first round bye next year if they make the playoff as an at large team they're playing this weekend it would be the the first round games would be this coming weekend so uh there would be no rest for the weary um and under the new format. So enjoy this last year of the 14 playoff, but it's not going to last. But the good news is like, you know, again, we're recording this on Tuesday. The SEC fully reveals their 2024 schedule Wednesday, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's two buys as part of that regular season, right? Like that's, there is. you know. <clears throat> For Alabama, I don't know if every other school gets the same schedule. I would have to check and see how that worked. Last time it happened for Alabama was 2019 that they had two buys. It just kind of depends on where the calendar falls in August in their first game and then where it falls at the end. Um, so, yeah, I, they'll have the first by probably the first weekend in October, I think, is is the best guess on that. And then we know the second by is going to be before the LSU game, um, whether it's the last weekend in October, first week in November. I forget the exact date, but two buys is nice. That's better than one buy, as they say. I enjoyed the the bye week this year because it like allowed me to kind of recapture my sleep schedule. And then the LSU Alabama game was like a 745 kick and we were working until like two in the morning, which means I didn't go to bed until like three in the morning. So like all that work I did over the bye week to like recapture my sleep, just punted it because, you know, Alabama LSU. It'd be nice. I mean, but for some reason that game always seems to be at night. Um, it's not the two thirty kickoff, which again, last year of that. So we have to see how things work out. They might even announce times for some of these games. Um, I don't know this week, but maybe fairly soon, at least by the spring or the summer, um, uh, because they can now, because it's all under one roof where it's ESPN, ABC networks. They don't have to worry about CBS picking a game every, whatever it was, 13 days before. So um, that's going to help, and we might know more game times earlier, which is going to be good for us, good for fans, good for everybody. <laughs> yeah, everybody can can pre-plan. Um, so yeah, schedule reveal out Wednesday. I was I figured now would be a good time to talk hoops. We haven't really talked a lot of hoops on the show, um, but they're nine games deep. Um, they're six and three. Men's hoops specifically started four and zero. Oh beating up on, um, I don't want to say a bunch of nobodies, but a bunch of teams that they probably should beat up on, right? South Alabama, Mercer, Indiana State, um, you know, hey, and then when they played Indiana State now, they're uh, they're top 15 in net somehow. I don't I, know how. Yeah, I, I, I don't... <laughs> it's a very you know, strange FBI type ranking for them, but I guess they're really good. It's still early, right? Like, I feel like a lot, you know, once these guys get into conference play and a lot of things I think will get flushed out ultimately. But, hey, I mean, that looks like a really good win for Alabama yeah. at the moment. Right now, Alabama's number 11 and net. Indiana State's number 12. So that's <laughs> that's a, that's their best win right now is Indiana State. Yeah. Um, they're 6-3. and three. Um, Again, started 4-0. and oh, Then they started playing um, – better teams or at least teams that we perceive to be better um and they have dropped three three of their last seven right so they're six and three overall lost to ohio state mm -hmm. lost to clemson um battled hard against purdue last saturday um ultimately lost that one they still got creighton and arizona coming up so a pretty tough non-conference schedule uh for the tide what are your early impressions of just kind of watching these guys play yeah i mean <laughs> i think and nato just keeps saying it every single time he talks so it's almost like a broken record, but it's true. Like their defense is the issue. Um, and that's, that's something where Nate always talks about it, where everybody kind of has the perception with his system that it's all about shooting threes. It's all about offense. It's all about going quick on offense, which is all true. Um, but it's also, you know, they've had some very good defensive teams. Um, the sweet 16 teams of 2021 and last year, you know, 2023, both had very good defenses. Um, so if you combine those two things, you have a really good team right now. I mean, they're 13th in Ken Palm, which is, you know, major analytical um, ranking and they're number one in offense, but they're number 87 in defense, which I think would be the worst that he's had uh, at Alabama if that you know remained true by the end of the season. So um, that's a big issue. Um, and that's continuing to miss Charles Bediaco, which I think is something that, you know, probably without saying it directly, I, I would assume that it kind of sticks in their crawl a little bit because he's, he should have probably stayed in school. Um, 
you know, he's playing in the NBA G League right now. He's not, you know, he probably could have used another year of school. And he, they really could have used him in this past game. That's, in fact, the reason why they scheduled Purdue in Toronto is because that's where Charles Bediaco is from. And, you know, it would have given them a seven-footer to play against Zach Eady. Um, instead, you had, you know, Mohamed Wagi and Nick Pringle and Jaron Stevenson, which are, you know, they're all 6'10", 6'11", but they're not Charles Bediaco in terms of being a defensive player and a rim protector. And, you know, it, they just ran out of bodies. And that you could tell early in that game, even when they were leading, they were in foul trouble. Zach Eady was still not getting fouled or not fouling himself. So there's a discrepancy there. You know, whether it's bad officiating or not, I'm not going to cast a ruling on that. But you kind of could tell early in the game that Alabama was going to run out of fouls and they're going to run out of big men. And they basically did once Wagi and Pringle got their fourth fouls early in the second half and they had to put Jaron Stevenson in. And Jaron Stevenson has not been a very good defensive player so far as a freshman. Uh, that's when the tide really turned. And, um, yeah. you know, they tried to put Wagi and Pringle back in late in the game and, Edie just kept going and he's seven foot four and 300 pounds. And just he's like Nate said last night on his radio show, just impossible to guard when they're officiating that game that tightly with him. So um, tough game for them. And, you know, I, like you said, it's a tough stretch coming up with, uh, you know, Creighton this weekend. Creighton is number eight in both polls this week, but they're number five in net. And then if Arizona holds it together this week, they're going to be the number one team in the country again next week uh, when Alabama has to go out there to Phoenix, which is basically a road game. Technically, it's a neutral site game. But, um, you know, potentially staring down six and five, which, you know, six and five in basketball is not the end of the world. Hopefully, and this is why Nate schedules it this way. You learn where you're exposed. Obviously, their defense has been exposed. And you try to correct it for SEC play, and ultimately it depends on if you win an SEC championship and get into the tournament, all that matters is how you play in March, not really how you play in December. So um, that's where they are. But I wouldn't say it's completely – even though they're number one offensively in the country, I still think like that – this past game was Mark Sears, Mark Sears, Mark Sears, completely everybody leaning on him. I would like to see more out of Grant Nelson. I feel like – you know, there's some spots, some games where, like, all right, he's really good. And there's other spots where it's just like this guy's not making a huge difference um, in terms of, you know, shooting can still get better. That was the biggest question for him. That's the reason why he stayed in school is the three-point shooting. That's still not consistently there. And then Aaron Estrada kind of disappeared in this past game, um, only five points. And that's something that Nate talked about, too, after the game was, you know, Mark Sears, even though he played at Ohio to start his career, now has a year plus under his belt of playing at Alabama, playing in really big games, knowing what it takes. Aaron Estrada, Grant Nelson, having coming, having come from mid majors, they're still trying to figure out what it takes in a big game like this. And I think that you know was on display in this last one. Yeah, um, I mean that 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 you you kind of went into like a little bit of in depth detail. Me watching that game, I was like, they just kind of ran out of gas, right? Like, which is. They effectively what players, you're saying right yeah. like i mean yeah like they, they ran into you know foul issues obviously but like a team like purdue like you got to put the full 40 minutes together and they just they just didn't do that you know for right. various reasons um do you, is this a team just based on what you've seen so far do you think that they can make the necessary adjustments defensively to perhaps become a little bit more well-rounded or is this a team that you think or is it too early to tell that this is going to be a team that they just need to out, outscore people this year uh well i think I think they can get better in defense. I don't know if they're going to get as good as they were, again, the two Sweet 16 years when they had Herb Jones the first time. And then last year, you know, Noah Clowney was a really good defensive player for him. Charles Bediaco was, you know, Namari Burnett, you know, was known for his defense. Um, I don't know if they're going to get that. And they're a really talented team. But, you know, is Muhammad Wagi going to become Charles Bediaco? I don't think so this year um i don't think nick pringle certainly won't he's more of an offensive player he's obviously had his issues with his attitude and approach this year you know the nate's made pretty clear um so i think you can correct some of these things and in the way nate explained it last night too was they unlike a lot of teams they work on offense when they start in the summer it's all offense it's all shooting because that's you know how nate wants to play and they really didn't start working on defense until they started practice officially in september the end of september so that's still a little bit new for them with all these new players trying to play defense together. But again, 
you know, do you have it underneath? I think it's underneath the basket that's the biggest issue for him. And, you know, Wagi is their best shot at being good under the basket, but he's not Charles Bediaco. And then on the perimeter, and Nate still talks about this, Mark Sears can get better on defense. Um, you know, Ryland Griffin, I think, has played well on defense this year. Estrada can probably get better. So I think there's a higher ceiling than what they have right now, but the ceiling is still probably lower than what it has been, um, you know, through first couple years of, of Oates' time. Yeah, I think the, you know, Oates has mentioned this before that like Ken Palm's not the be all end all, but it's a pretty good, you know, indicator of kind of where they're at. Um, you know, you look at Ken Palm's teams, um, the way they have them ranked advanced analytics and all that nine of Ken Palm's top 10 are top 20 in adjusted defense. So I think he yep. sees that and it's like, Hey, like if we really want to make a run, like last year was very special. If they want to replicate that, like there needs to be at least some significant, man, I don't even know if significance the right word, but there needs to be improvement on the defensive end. Um, Cause obviously they're going to shoot and score. Like they are going right. to score a lot of points, but like, you know, if they're just in track meets all season, like that's just not conducive to March, March success. Cause at some point yeah. you're going to go cold and you don't want to go cold at the wrong, at the wrong time. Yep. And yeah, I mean, there's still, there's going to be opportunities in the sec. They play Tennessee twice. That can be a good or bad thing. I mean, Tennessee is probably the best team in the sec this year. <laughs> um, if you beat him twice, that's a really good thing, you know, for your, your situation. If you lose to him twice, that's going to be a bad thing. So um, there's going to be opportunities against them in Texas A&M. Um, I mean, Kentucky's probably a little bit down from where they were, but. Talk about a team that can shoot the ball. They can shoot the ball this year. Right. Right. And, you know, we'll see. Again, it's a long season. Um, it's different than football that you can lose a bunch of games this time of year and still be in a perfect spot by March. And that's that's usually what they're playing for. So um, check back in two months on them. <laughs> I guess my last uh, basketball question, you've, you've, you've said a lot of individual names that you're kind of maybe hoping to see more from, but in terms of just collectively over the next couple of games, right? They play Creighton on the 16th, Arizona on the 20th. What do you want to see from those two games that, you know, I don't know if it'll be like market improvement, but like that would give you optimism that they're trending in the right direction. Well, yeah, it's basically that. It's like everybody looks at the Purdue game and there's, even though they lost, there's a lot of positive vibes and people saying it was a, gritty performance and uh they took a step forward as a team and they played hard and they played tough and those are all good things like this wasn't a game where nate oates was coming out after the game and saying we didn't have effort which he does sometimes um it wasn't one of those games it was we played hard it just didn't fall our way but that doesn't always mean the next game is going to be a linear progression upward you know that just yeah. because you played well against purdue and you almost won means if you do a couple things better against Creighton or you do a couple things better against Arizona, that that means you're going to win. Like it doesn't always work that way. So even though there's a lot of optimism that things are trending in the right direction, who knows what's going to happen in the next game. Creighton's a tough environment to play. It's a, it's a very good basketball school. It's uh, you know, a really established team, a really established coach. And then, you know, Arizona's the best team in the country and you're going into not their house, but their house since Phoenix. Um, so, again, they can learn some things from this. They can learn some things from going on the road. But I don't know if just because you played well in certain aspects against Purdue means those things are going to automatically click again in these next two games. Makes sense to me. It'll be interesting to see how they do. We'll obviously keep tabs on that. Um, that's our 10 to 12 minute hoops conversation. We'll obviously dig more into that um, once we clear the football hurdle, but still a lot going on in the world of football. Wanted to discuss um, because this week, I mean, really started last week, but especially this week, a lot of the all American lists are coming out. I believe we've had Walter camp uh, football writers um, association. AP has come out. I think we still have what sporting news is still coming out maybe later today. A um, couple other, maybe lists. There's also, you know, like CBS sports, the athletic, all those guys do all American lists as well. But I know that there's like five that count as, you know, mm -hmm. towards, consensus all americans um handful of alabama names have been named to those lists um walter camp um was a little surprising dallas turner and jc latham were both named to the second team football writers association of america had turner on the first team latham on the second team ap the ap really loved alabama right turner kool-aid terry and arnold were all on first team jc latham caleb downs will reichard were all on or I guess Caleb Downs and J.C. Latham were on second team, and then Will Reichard was on third team. Still have a couple more All-American lists coming out. Um, 
are you I'm surprised that maybe there hasn't been more um recognition for some of Alabama's guys through the first few all-American lists that have come out. I feel like AP was maybe a little bit better of representation of how well some of these guys played this year. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, I mean, there's a bigger discrepancy between these lists than I can remember in past years, um, which I think part of that might be stat-based. But then you can say, like, Terry and Arnold's stats are really good this year. Um, they're yeah. better than Kool-Aid's. And obviously that's not – doesn't always tell the whole story for corners. Sometimes corners don't get thrown at, and so they don't have a lot of picks and a lot of um, passes defense. But I think just from watching games, we know that Terron Arnold's played really well. We know that kool played really well. Um, but for Terron not to be part of either the first team or the second team with the Walter Camp and then with um, football writers, but then to be a first-team pick on the AP was a little bit strange. Um, you know, I think – and it depends on who exactly is watching what games. And maybe there's, you know, people haven't watched maybe quite as much Alabama this year because they thought they were down early in the year. Um, you know, that might play into it a little bit. Ultimately, it's a different pool of voters that are voting on each one of these. So they all have certain games or teams that they've watched more than others. And you try to get a representative sample. I think the AP does a really good job of that because they have, you know, their national – writers from every corner of the country. So, um, you know, it's, it's tough in the way that like you're trying to compare, you know, Dallas Turner versus like, I think it was an old dominion linebacker that got onto Walter camp first team. And that player at that level of football might be playing really well, but Dallas Turner at Alabama and the sec, yeah, I feel like should get the edge. So, um, how the kind of way those is tough sometimes, um, you know, same thing with, you know, the, the kickers and, you know, I, I don't think level of competition comes into the kickers conversation quite as much. It's not like when you're kicking the ball, like it matters what who's lined up against you, like the talent on the other side doesn't really matter, but uh, you know, the pressure of kicking in the sec and those stadiums and those environments, especially on the road, I think is, is worth noting um, compared to the back. You know, when you're talking about Miami, Ohio's kicker, Graham Nicholson. And Graham Nicholson's only missed one kick all year, and that was in the MAC championship, which yeah. is a bigger environment. Will Riker had missed, what, two in the LSU game, you know, at mm -hmm. home, and then had the miss, um, <coughs> was it Kentucky? Auburn, Auburn. Auburn. Right. Which is a tough environment. Like, Graham Nicholson's probably never kicked in an environment like Auburn. So, <laughs> you know, it's hard to kind of compare different levels and maybe one day we're not talking about Alabama being at the same level of college football as Miami, Ohio. I mean, that's something that's brewing, as we saw with the NCAA, you know, proposal from last week. Um, but for right now, you're trying to compare again, Old Dominion linebacker versus Alabama linebacker. Alabama fans, I'm sure, will always say it's the Alabama guy. But I don't think there's an Alabama fan out there that's probably watching Old Dominion game this year. So it's kind of the difficult part of picking these teams and. Um, it's an inexact science, and I think we're seeing that play out, you know, with these various voting pools coming up with different results. Yeah, and that, you know, I, I appreciate that there's multiple All-American teams um, because it does allow for a lot of guys to get recognized in that way. Like, you know, and I'm not saying that all these Alabama guys should have been first team on Walter Camp or first team with the Football Writers Association, like – I did find it a little strange that only two guys from Alabama were on the Walter camp list and they were both on second team. I, I kind of thought Dallas Turner should have been a first team pick. I was a little shocked that neither cornerback, right. Terry and uh, Kool-Aid weren't listed for the Walter camp. Um, you know, which is why I was like, you know, Hey, like the AP seemed to, you know, make a little bit more sense to me personally. Um, you know, even though I am a football writer um, and the Football Writers um, Association of America only, again, only named Turner and Latham, um, you know, just I don't know. Like, it's it's good, I guess, to get more guys recognized, but just for as good as Alabama has been. And it could have been a perception thing, like you said, you know, like they, they lose to Texas early. They struggle against South Florida. Not very many people pay attention to them. And so, you know, maybe they just don't obviously I don't see them the same way that we do. Um, you know, there's a lot of guys on these lists, you know, and again, pulling up the Walter Camp list and I've got the AP list in front of me as well you know, a lot of these guys make a lot of sense, right? Like Michael Penix, <coughs> first team quarterback, thumbs up there. Ollie Gordon, first team running back from Oklahoma State, thumbs up there. Had no issue with Harrison or Neighbors or Bowers at first team. Um, I'm not the foremost offensive line expert, but none of those guys look out of place, I guess, to me. 
Um, you know, so then it's like, okay, who do you sub off to put Latham on? Like that's the, you know, right. age old question. Um, you Zach know, but just it was, all really good too. Those are, Oh yeah. Yeah. Really like time. there's a lot of really good offensive linemen, you know, like Zinter from Michigan. Like I know he went down in the big 10 championship game. Here's hoping that he can play in the Rose bowl. I know he's a very good, very good player. Um, you know, so there's, it was, it was just kind of interesting um, to, you know, see some of these lists come out and it's like interesting picks there. Um, you know, and not to poo poo the old dominion linebacker. Cause I know that that was the example that we used or, you know, the James Madison defensive lineman. Right. You know, and I don't know who else they maybe would have put there. I'm not sure that a boy should have been an all American on D lineman, but um, it was, I don't know. It was just interesting to me. And I was, I was a little confused at some of the lists, but then, you know, the AP came out and I was just like that, that makes a little bit more sense to me. I was a little surprised actually that both the corners were first team picks uh terry on and kool-aid for the ap team i figured they would put kool-aid one terry on two or maybe put terry on two because or terry on one kool-aid two because terry on has all the picks but um i don't know and there was, was a little extra spot on the ap team too for an extra a fifth db which is where terry on made it um which helps if you have five db spots versus four in the other lists that's just so goofy like are we, it is. Are, are we running a four, two, five, or are we running a three, four? Like what kind of defense are we running? College football is very fragmented that way. You know, there's multiple awards for the same thing. You know, the Ben Narek and the Nagurski for defensive player, yeah. et cetera. The NFL does it a little bit more um, standardized, which is just the AP voting is what determines the MVP and the all pro teams. And, you know, the all pro teams do adjust over time to account for, you know, having a nickel back or having a third wide receiver, or not having a fullback. Um, but again, you're doing ha you're having it as one organization that's kind of deciding everything versus all sorts of things all over the wall here. But again, that I guess you can make the argument that you're bringing in different viewpoints in that case. Yeah. So I, as cool as it would be, you know, I think it was, is it only Dallas Turner who I think has the opportunity to be a consensus all American or maybe Latham as well? Um, not Latham. I mean, technically, anybody who's made the first team so far, because there's two more or less. The AFCA comes out today. Um, probably by the time this publishes, will be out. And then uh, the sporting news tomorrow. So anybody who's made the first team on one of these lists so far can theoretically get the last two and become consensus. Mm -hmm. So Turner can become consensus today. Um, if Kool-Aid, Tarion are both um, first team on these last two, which I tend to doubt, but if that happens, then they would be consensus as well. Interesting. This is this is my first rodeo with with college football all American list. So I'm learning so much. You didn't have many of those at Iowa. <laughs> they, the Iowa always had a few. You know, like I think they was they had like two. They had two all Americans, right? Like Cooper DeGene, who's very very good. Um, you know, I'm Tory personally Taylor. rooting for that kid because I watched him all the way through his high school years. Um, and then Tory Taylor at punter, which makes sense because Iowa. Um, but Doesn't he yeah, have the most not, yards in NCAA history? Did I see that right? I he's he either out. has it or he's close to it because like I don't know that anybody has punted more than he has this year. <laughs> uh, that's right. I think he's going to do it in the bowl game. Is what I remember from the award show. He's going to break. The yeah, record. he's. I think he's like twenty yards away because he won the you know the Ray Guy Award. Um, so yeah, he's at four thousand one hundred nineteen total punting yards which leads the country. Um, he's also done it on 86 punts, which also leads the country. Uh, mm -hmm. Second place is Navy's Riley Reithman. Rethman, hope I'm pronouncing that right. Six fewer punts, about 600 fewer yards. Um, so I guess, you know, if you go by average, Tory Taylor's still um, pretty good at the whole punting thing. Yeah, he, he works. He's another Australian, just like James Burnup. How many, okay, I mean, we, you and I have both written different versions of this in different years, but like these Australian punters come in and win the Ray Guy Award, like, and they've done it for the last, I don't know how many years. Yeah, it's, I looked it up um, recently, but yeah, there's, I mean, there's a lot of Australian punters in college football now. It's almost becoming the norm to have one, um, but uh, it's, it's been a, a lot. Ray Guy Award. Seven yeah, I mean, of the last 10 coming into this year. So Tory Taylor would make eight of the last 11. Yeah. So Corsac last year, the only one that really wasn't was, or uh, Presley Harvin and Matt Ariza back to back years. But Matt go. Duffy, or I guess Braden Mann, but Michael Dixon was, Mitch Wisnowski, Tom Hackett. Yeah. I mean, it's, 
almost every single year there's one. So down under yeah. punter. Go get, go get one while you can. And a lot of yeah. those guys are making their way to the NFL too. Like that's you know. Yeah, I mean I <clears throat> burn up I feel like is moving towards getting some serious NFL consideration. Um we'll have to see what he does. I mean, I probably makes sense for him to come back for one more year. Um, but you know, I want to completely rule out the possibility of him going to the NFL if if there is, you know, if there's people looking at his season and you know, he had a pretty good season. There was some punts. I think even Nick Saban's even kind of complained about them, the AM game where he got hurt and he said Will Riker was giving them a better hang time and <laughs> was a little bit ruthless on Saban's part. Um talking about Burnup getting hurt and he actually didn't mind it because Riker wasn't punting to Anaya Smith. Uh but no, he's had a really good year. And again, I think if we're talking about James Burnup playing in NFL in two years, that wouldn't shock me. Yeah, no, fifth in the country in average punt. Only he's punted 52 times, but, you know, 47 plus yards per punt, pretty good. Um, yeah, I do think another year of consistency for him before he jumps to the league probably makes a lot of sense. Um, also gives Alabama another year to figure out what punting would look like, or at least punting life after James Burnup would look like. And it was very inconsistent before him. I mean, to have – he's basically been the only guy who's punted for Alabama the last three seasons now. And the first yeah. two seasons they covered this team, they had like six guys who punted. They had walk-ons. They were trying everybody. Um, so to get burn up and have him be as consistent as he's been has been a, a huge win for that area. Yeah. So I'd, I'd like to think that he'll probably come back for another year, but I suppose we'll see. I don't know. I I haven't seen his name pop up on – obviously you don't see a lot of punters on draft boards, but – um, you know, just Bill Belichick still coaching next year. Maybe they'll draft him. He might. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, speaking of NFL, I actually wrote about Mac Wilson in the Bama in the NFL write up that we do every week because he had a pretty good game last Thursday. So shout out to Mac Wilson. Yeah. Um, last thing I wanted to get to on today's show, um, we kind of hinted at a little bit with with Ray Guy, but the National College Football Awards more or less all the way out. Um, Jaden Daniels from LSU won the Heisman. Uh, Dallas Turner and Will Reichard were both snubbed on their national awards. Um, I guess we can start there. Um, do we feel like Turner and Reichard should have won their respective awards? So, I mean, I'll start with Reichard. I think missing the Iron Bowl kick probably didn't help him. Yeah. Um, so a lot of people were watching that game. Um, and, again, you're being compared to Nicholson, who only missed one kick. Um, and then uh, Pisano from UNLV, Jose Pisano, who, how many? 25 of 27. 25 of 27, yeah. So that's the number people are going to look at. Um, again, I don't know how many people are watching UNLV games or Miami, Ohio games. You're going to look at the overall number. Rikers was a little bit lower. I know, you know, there's the whole thing about him being the all-time points leader. I don't think that really should factor into. Yeah, that's that's a career award. A career since career award and again not to take credit away from will reichard but it helps when you get a fifth year because of covid to get up to that number and it also helps right. when you play with an alabama offense for the last five years that has put up a lot of points you have a lot of opportunities to hit extra points and that helps your overall total so again i think will reichard's been an excellent player for him he's probably the best kicker in alabama history that's not the first stat i would point to in terms of him being so good um because that's more of a counting stat. It's more of a volume, how long you played uh, versus making big kicks and really key moments, which he's done a really good job of doing um, yeah. compared to his, his predecessors, especially. I think the, you know, and I'm looking this up now because I was just thinking about it. The, the stat I would point to for Will Reichert is that, you know, he's 20 of 23 this season. Um, on field goals. And I know that 10 of his kicks have been from 40 plus um, when he had that stretch where he made, I think like what, 28, 29 in a row, you know, about, you know, just under half of them were from 40 plus. So like, it was one of those things where like, you know, even if Alabama didn't get to the red zone, they were almost always guaranteed points because of how strong of a leg he had, um, you know, but like, great, you know, so if you want to argue that Will Record got snubbed, you know, Graham Nicholson went, you know, he also had 10 field goals made from 40 plus. So, you know, along a 52, um, I don't know, Pinzano's, um, you know, automatic, you know, 40 from 40 plus, but that would have been the argument, I guess you could make, um, you know, for Riker this year, but also, you know, the, the couple that he missed, I believe were uh, two of the three that he missed. I know were from 
40 plus, and then he missed another one, I think, from a little bit closer. He was he it was weird. He 10 field goals made from 40 plus. Um, he missed two from 40 to 49 yards, but he was perfect from 50 and beyond. I think he went like right. three for three. It was so, that one late in the LSU game that was really close, and I was standing right there in the field. I was like, man, it just didn't look right. Um, yeah. but it didn't really affect anything in that game. So um, yeah, I mean, if we're gonna look at stats like for kickers, I think it's uh, location of the kick, home versus away. If you're making big kicks in the road, um, it's time of the game and the score of the game, which you need like an advanced stat system to really break down a lot of that. But fourth quarter, you know, one score games, how do you perform there? And then it's distance, like you just mentioned. So um, that's how I would break it down. I don't have those stats available to me. I used to when I worked for ESPN. You could just plug in like fourth <laughs> quarter, like games within four points. How do the kickers do? And it's really easy to pull that up, but um, not for us common folks. <laughs> um, Turner did not win the Bednarik Award, which goes to the most outstanding defensive player. Um, NC State's Peyton Wilson, who also won the Dick Buckus Award for the most outstanding linebacker, won that award. Are we good with that? Do we think Turner should have gotten a little bit more love? I have some thoughts, but I'll I'll let you go first. I I didn't watch a single NC State game this year. Um, <laughs> I can assure you of that. So I don't – it's one of those things. I I can't tell you Peyton Wilson from Adam's house cat, as Nick Saban likes to say. Um, but his stats are, are pretty intense. You know, he had double-digit tackles in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine games this year. He had 16 tackles in Miami. Um Tackles for loss. He had 17 and a half tackles for loss, six sacks, uh, forced fumble, two fumble recoveries, three interceptions, uh, 10 quarterback hits, uh, six passes broken up, which, again, these are going to be stat-based awards. Turner's stats, his sack numbers were not as gaudy as what Will Anderson had um, last two years, especially two years ago. And that ultimately is, I think, what keeps Turner from winning those awards. Um, Again, people are going to look at sacks. People are going to look at, you know, again, tackles for loss, breakups, interceptions. Like, how are you affecting the game? And if you don't have the stats, people are going to say that you're not as good. Which, again, there's there's um, failures in the logic there sometimes, especially when you're considering Turner's going up against SEC um, offensive linemen. The ACC was down this year. Um, I don't know if Peyton Wilson is seeing quite the same level of talent. Um, but again, I I wasn't really expecting Turner to win those. I was last year when Will Anderson was a finalist because his numbers were so <clears throat> extravagant. A lot of people knew about him. Um, I just don't think it was quite there with Turner in terms of the recognition this year. Yeah, I guess when when I think of li- like I think people, you know, he's up for a linebacker award, um, you know, or at least like he's being classified as a linebacker. That's probably the better way to phrase it. He's being classified as a linebacker when he's really an edge rusher and like edge rushers and middle linebackers like Peyton Wilson, like they're just two fundamentally different positions, even though they're both kind of, you know, adjacent to each other on the field. Like, you know, if Will Anderson's going to win those awards, it's because he has such gaudy pass rushing stats that it's like, you cannot ignore that. Um, Turner was fantastic this year. I, I would argue that probably should have been a first team all American across the board. Um, I'm glad he's in position to potentially be a consensus All-American because I think he was that good. He came up in <laughs> big moments for Alabama this year, um, and he was just ultra productive as a pass rusher. He was also ultra productive just as an edge rusher, edge defender. Like he sets the run very well. He's a freak athlete. Like there was, you know, one of Auburn's long runs in that game. Like it was Turner who ran, you know, every bit of 40, 50, 60 yards down the field to go make the tackle. Like the guy is a fantastic player. But when I think of like you know, middle linebackers. I think of guys who more for more, like I think of guys who stuff the stat sheet effectively. And that's kind of what Peyton Wilson did. Like he tackles for loss, sacks, interceptions, passes defended. Like he just, I think of the middle linebacker as guys who can do a little bit of everything. I think Dallas can do that. Alabama needed him as an edge rusher this year and they needed Deontay Lawson to be that middle linebacker role. So that's just, if you're looking at, you know, most outstanding defensive player, Dallas has a case, um, you know, but when you're just, if you're looking at both of them as linebackers, I feel like Peyton Wilson's going to win every time, deservedly so. He was very, very productive, even though he played an ACC schedule and not an SEC schedule like Dallas Turner did. Um, so the big glossy awards, I'm okay with Dallas not winning too. I think I'm in the same right. way as you. Yeah, and the defensive player, obviously, you're wrapping in defensive backs who all have different 
roles and um, stats. And um, I don't know if Wilson and like Wilson, I think was up for the Buckus. Yeah. You want it, right? Yeah. The Turner really wasn't Turner wasn't yeah. even considered for the Buckus because that wasn't his position on the field. And a lot of these awards have very archaic um, terminology in terms of who's being considered, you know, Outland Trophy, I think, is interior lineman. But when they say interior lineman, they don't just always offensive tackles that get nominated for it. It's goofy. And tight ends too, tight ends and offensive tackles and guards because interior linemen in the classic sense of football, I'm talking like 1940s, meant you you weren't including split ends. Yeah. So you're goofy. not including wide receivers. So you're saying interior lineman means everything except the wide receiver because that's how football used to be played when you had ends, tackles, guards, center. So they're very, and then okay. it ultimately went to a defensive player. This year. <laughs> right. And they're trying to, um, I guess, keep some sort of consistency, but again, you're comparing how football was played 70 years ago to how it's played now. Yeah. It's just tough to do. Um, but there's not the same thing. Like edge rusher is at a defensive end. We're talking like all American teams. Is that an outside linebacker? Is that a defensive end? Um, there's not really, a, I mean, the Ted Hendricks award, which is kind of, not really known as a defensive end award, but there's not really a specific award for an edge rusher, unlike the Remington trophy for a center or, you know, running back tight end, Mackey, Toke Walker, et cetera. So you're trying to fit these guys into different definitions that everybody may not agree upon. Yeah. Well, and then on top of that, you know, like not everybody runs the same defensive personnel that like Alabama runs, you know? So like if you create an edge rusher specific award, you know, then you're alienating, you know, probably half college football teams. Like we don't have a traditional edge rusher. We don't have a guy that plays the role that Dallas Turner plays. Um, you know, so that's, then you get really sticky there. I don't know. I, if, if, if Alabama would have asked Dallas Turner to play more of a traditional linebacker role, I think he could have stuffed the stat sheet like Peyton Wilson did this year, but they needed him to be an edge rusher. They needed him to be an edge defender. And he was fantastic at that. And so I don't think that, you know, him getting snubbed um, for this award takes away from his season because I think his recognition comes with the all American list. And those are, those are coming out in the way that I think they should to, to recognize how impactful he was this year. So. Right. And the NFL draft of course will reveal some things as well. And I was looking at. Yeah. He's going to be like a top 10, top 15 pick. Like he's going to be. <laughs> yeah. right. Matt Miller has him at number six overall um, in his, his mock draft today for ESPN. So. Um, I think he's going to be all right without the awards. Yeah. And Matt Miller, by the way, has Terry and Arla at number 11 going to the Atlanta Falcons. So the last, uh, yeah, shout out Matt Miller from, uh, from Missouri, just South of Kansas city, by the way. Um, the last time I think it was, I, I read Dane Brugler's, uh, mock draft. Um, he had four Alabama guys in the first round. Um, so I think he had, he had Turner off first, both Kool-Aid and, uh, Terry on and Latham all in the first like 25 picks. So here's, so. here's uh Matt Miller has five Alabama's Alabama players in the first round. Oh, did he put Braswell in the first round at the end? He did as the number 31st hey. overall pick. Um, so yeah, I will, uh, I'll tweet that out in fact, because I think that's <laughs> so, good for them. That yeah, is, but, yeah. That's, point that's, being, I think Dallas Turner is going to be all right. It would have been nice if he won an award, but it is what it is. He's not going to get drafted off what awards he made or not. Yeah, that's – yeah, so he'll be all right. Um, wrapping up, I, I mean, also he was the SEC Defensive Player of the Year, which I think is, you know, that's that's a pretty good award to have and also kind of more indicative of the impact that he had for Alabama defense. And that's voted upon by SEC coaches too. So it doesn't get better than that in terms of people who have watched you play and kind of know what you're about. Yeah. hundred um, percent. We can wrap this up here. Went a little longer than I thought we would today. Um, Jaden Daniels won the Heisman beat out Michael Penix beat out Bo Nix beat out Marvin Harrison. Um, I think we're on the same page. Not an issue with Jaden Daniels winning the Heisman big thumbs up there. Uh, yeah, I, I didn't, you know, I think there is like a, a floor in terms of like, you can't lose, you can't, I don't know how to say this. Like you can't be the quarterback of a bad team. LSU right. wasn't a bad team. Like LSU, I think competed really well with Alabama for three plus quarters of that game. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think that should have held Jaden Daniels back. Like LSU's defense, you know, should have been a, a fault against Jaden Daniels and, like we all saw what sort of player he is. 
Yeah. Um, you know, Michael Penix is really a player. I don't know if he's quite as dynamic as Jaden Daniels in both phases. That's what I kept coming back to. Like, because when you think of the Heisman, like the verbiage that they use is like most outstanding player. Penix mm-hmm. and Bo Nix were both fantastic in their own rights. I'm not sure that there was a more outstanding dynamic football player this year than Jaden Daniels. And part of that is because he's a quarterback. So he touches the ball on every single play because I think there's a case for, you know, Marvin Harrison is the best pound for pound receiver, which was, you know, rewarded with the Bolitnikoff. There's a case for Brock Bowers is the best pound for pound tight end. He was rewarded with the John Mackey again. Um, I would argue that Tavondre Sweat from Texas, the defensive lineman, has a case as the best pound for pound player, especially at his specific position. Um, you know, but like when you're talking about dynamic players, most outstanding players, you know, and this could be the SEC bias because we got to watch Jaden Daniels in person and we got to see him a lot more down here than we did Penix and Bo Nix. But like there was I I'm I'm cool with Jaden Daniels winning it. That said, if they had given it to Penix, which I believe they gave one of the I think they gave him the Maxwell Award this year, like yep. thumbs up there. Like the dude had a really good year. And when his team needed wins or needed to close out games, they put the ball in his hands and he came through virtually every time. Um, but I'm yeah, I that the combination of stats and just the ability to be dynamic with the ball in his hands. Like I don't know that there was anybody better than Jaden Daniels. So yeah, cool. I agree. It it didn't seem like it was a big like there wasn't controversy to me or it didn't seem like there was a big expectation that anybody else was going to win it besides him, unless I missed something. But um, there were, I mean, there were a lot of people who maybe thought, I think there were a lot of people that were upset that like Marvin was there. Um, right. You know, and especially like that, I think there was a huge contingent of like Florida state fans, for example, which fair argument, like if our quarterback being hurt, kept us out of the playoff, shouldn't he be at the Heisman ceremony, which I get it. Like, I, I understand. <laughs> but injuries are always – and, you know, Alabama has kind of been through the same thing with Tua in 2019. Like, Tua was – I remember writing about it going to that LSU game that year. It was him and Joe Burrow were the two main Heisman candidates. Joe Burrow wins that game. Tua gets hurt. Well, he was already hurt. He had an ankle from a week earlier. Then he got hurt a week later at Mississippi State with the hip. And that was the end of his season in the second week in November, very similar to Jordan Travis. And at that point, Tua was completely off the Heisman radar. Like nobody was expecting him to win. So I feel like injuries, even if they're late in the year like that, are going to do you in. Like the Heisman race has really won those last two or three weeks of the season, including the conference championship games, which as we saw, Bo Nix was the favorite going into that Oregon Washington game. So I, if Bo Nix would have balled out and Oregon would have beaten Washington, like not only do I think Oregon would have been in the playoff, but I think Bo Nix would have probably won the Heisman. And I would have been cool with that because you, I mean, you talk about gaudy stats. Like I right. know that Pac 12 defenses are not as good as SEC defenses, just on the whole, but like to still complete almost 78% of your passes over the course of 13 games, like that is ridiculous. It's really good. Yeah. Really good. So. You know, but it broke the way it broke, and I don't have an issue with it. I, there was a certain segment of people that maybe did for various reasons, but whatever. Shout out to Jaden Daniels. I'll end with here. Um, we've seen some early 2024 Heisman uh, favorites. Uh, we've seen those lists come out, and Jalen Milrow is at the top of a lot of those lists. Kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's rarely do those actually pan out. Um I think Caleb Williams was on the top of a lot of them, but um, you know, Quinn Ewers is another big one that I've seen in terms of him being, um, you know, potential Heisman candidate, Heisman winner next year. Uh, Ollie Gordon, who was number seven in the voting this year. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, Milrow is going to be right there. Um, If he can, and again, these are stats based awards too. So I don't think you can, be where he's at statistically this year and win the award next year. I think he has to improve his passing numbers, his touchdown numbers, all that. But the physical talent's there. And, you know, just have to see if he can put it all together next year. Yeah, I think the the way he's played these last five games, he has to play that way over the course of an entire season. And then I think he'll firmly be in the conversation. Um, yep. Not that he was bad through the first – eight games, um, but he wasn't nearly as effective or productive as he has been these last five games. So if he can take this five game stretch and turn it into an entire season, I think he, I, I, at the very least, I think he's in New York. Um, 
but you know, that'll be next season and we'll cross that bridge when, and if we get there, um, that is, that's all I had today. You got anything else you want to get off your chest before we sign off today? That's it. I'm good. That is, uh, that's, that's it. Yeah. Just kind of riffing back and forth. We'll be back later this week. I'm going to try and get Talty on to ask him about Christmas music, but then also we'll talk SEC schedule. We'll talk, you know, a couple other things that are kind of out there in the ether when it comes to college football, maybe a little bit more men's hoops, um, you know, after we hopefully talk to Oates sometime later this week. But in the meantime, be sure to rate and review the show wherever you listen to your podcast, Apple, Stitcher, Spotify, even our Bama 247 YouTube page. Subscribe to Bama 247 and 247 Sports. Believe we still have the transfer portal Palooza deal still going on where you can get 60% off for an entire uh, annual yearly subscription. I believe that's an upgradable subscription too. So if you're already subscribed, go take advantage of that deal. Um, especially if you're an Alabama fan, but really if you're just college sports fan in general. Thank you again, Mike, for joining us. Thank you again so much, guys, for listening. We will talk to you all again soon.